You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Cities all over the United States have struggled to develop methods to review police actions that are both fair and have the confidence of the community. Like many cities, Cincinnati has multiple layers of review by different organizations. Each body represents a different constituency and a different perspective. The first step in the review process is conducted by the internal investigation section of the Cincinnati Police Department itself. A second level of review is undertaken by the Office of Municipal Investigations, which reports directly to the city manager. Of course, the county prosecutor can, has the option of reviewing any incident that might raise the question of possible criminal prosecution. And now, the new Citizens Police Review Panel. Last Monday, March 6, 2000, the Citizens Police Review Panel released its first report. The report focused on a review of the fatal shooting of Michael Carpenter on March the 19th, 1999, in Northside. On the day the panel issued its findings, Frank Graff prepared this report for 12 News. Be understood that this panel reached a unanimous finding in our report. The panel says the officers' suspicions of Carpenter clouded every decision made and it compounded mistakes in police procedures. Officer Miller did not ask Mr. Carpenter to put the car in park or to turn it off. The panel also questioned officers' fears about a gun. One was never found, but Carpenter never got out of the car as police ordered. Officer McCurley says he saw that Mr. Carpenter was feverishly moving his hands, although he states that he could not see Mr. Carpenter's hands. Officer McCurley drew his firearm. The report concludes McCurley should never have fired seven shots through the back window without a clear view of his partner struggling with Carpenter. We have reviewed over and over Officer McCurley's explanations of his actions, but we can find nothing in those explanations that would amount to a valid reason for using deadly force. Family members listened closely, wiping tears throughout the hearing. I'm very satisfied because I, I knew that the truth would come out, you know. The panel also forwarded six recommendations to the city manager, including that police make new policies for disabling cars during traffic stops, firing through glass, contacting family members, and educating the public about traffic stops. I certainly have a lot of, of uh, sympathy for the people on this board and the fact that how do you make a rule or regulation that addresses every possible circumstance that occurs? I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. To discuss the implications of this report, I am joined by Keith Borders, the chair of the Citizens Police Review Panel. Mr. Borders, a resident of Cincinnati neighborhood of Paddock Hills, is the senior attorney in the law department of Lens Crafters. Before joining Lens Crafters, Mr. Borders served in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice as a trial attorney. Joining Mr. Borders this morning is Cincinnati Ch Chief of Police, Tom Stryker. Keith, Tom, um, welcome back to Newsmakers in both cases. Um, is the goal of the panel to create a rule, as the chief said on that tape on Monday afternoon, to, about every possible incident? Is that what you're out to do? No, it's not. Um, but I agree with Chief Stryker that I think that would uh, be potentially impossible. Uh, Dan, we have the task pursuant to the ordinance passed by City Council to review the final reports, the final investigation reports for OMI and IIU. Uh, we did that in this case. Based upon that analysis, that extensive review, we are then faced under the ordinance with making specific recommendations to the City Manager. Uh, our recommendations can both be both specifically regarding that incident, uh, but in addition, uh, in the future could also pertain to any sort of um, series of actions that we've seen or uh, systemic issues or problems. So patterns. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Chief, uh, this is the first time for the police department through this process with this new panel. First time for the panel, of course, through the process. Uh, there's been a lot of reaction that we've heard from police officers, from representatives. What is officially your reaction uh, from the department and secondly how are people responding in the department 
Well, my reaction to it initially is that we, we disagree with the report and the finding of the, re the report that the panel came up with. But um, I think that's what's important here is that exactly what you said, this is a new process that's taking place. And the overall goal of this process should be to improve the operations of the police division, to improve the relations the police division has with this community, because ultimately that's who we receive our power and authority from. Uh, to simply close it out and say that nothing the panel says has any value to us is not what I'm saying here. As you just asked Mr. Borders, is it, it, I'm not, I don't mean to make the representation that it's their goal to try to pass a rule for it, but I think that's what's so fundamentally difficult for everyone to understand, even for officers to understand out there, is that there's no hard scientific rule that we can follow in addressing a situation. We have to address it according to tactics that we've evolved over the years that we think are the best way to do business in most of the situations. The unknown factor is that, that element of human emotion, and that element of human emotion is driven by so many different things and not limited to something such as substance abuse, or am I mad at my wife, or do I like the police or not? And so you never know what's going to occur. You never know how someone's going to react. And so these things are dynamic. They evolve very rapidly. And you have to make decisions in a split second. I want to be clear now. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some of the specific recommendations in a moment. Uh -huh. From your perspective, and therefore communicating to the rest of the police department, is this a legitimate process? Do you welcome a new voice in this process? Well, it has to be a legitimate process because the it's not up to the police to determine whether or not we want to be reviewed by civilian authority. It, it doesn't make any difference what I think is the police chief and certainly all the officers are entitled to their own opinions but in, in a professional perspective and a professional way of, of, of dealing with this it's the citizens who grant us our authority. Law has evolved from a citizen desire so as the citizens in effect are our boss and if the citizens say that they want to have a citizens review panel then it's up to them. It's their decision and all I can say to you is that we're obligated to work within that system and work with that system as best as we possibly can. Another thing here, you, you mentioned before that you disagree with this. What, what action will you take? Will you try to articulate those disagreements? Well, what we're going to do is, is the division is putting together a panel of our senior members and we're going to review the report. Uh, there are several different units that were involved in the investigation and we'll assign each portion of the report that that unit conducted in the investigation to present their rebuttal, then we'll, we will uh, prepare a final report to the city manager with our rebuttal in, in aspects that, that we disagree with findings in that report. And also, if there, are, if there are aspects of that report, and I'm sure there will be, that we agree with in recommendations and in actions taken, then we will certainly say where we agree with them. And I think the overall, the overall thought here has to be for us to put together the various perspectives. There's a police perspective, there's a civilian perspective, OMI's perspective, there's the entire world's perspective that has to be considered and we have to consider all those if we're going to learn how to do this, do this better. Um, Keith, I think the fact that this board, after there had been several other reviews, came out and disagreed, or actually agreed with some parts of some reports and some parts of another, right. but had its own perspective, what does that say? Well, Dan, I think that speaks to exactly um, the reason why this panel was created. It is crucial in this time in Cincinnati's history that the citizens' input be part of what I think everyone agrees with have been some all-time low relations between the community and the police. If we want to improve those relations, it's critical that the community, uh, whether it's these seven citizens or seven other citizens in the future, have an opportunity to assess and review these internal investigation reports. So I think what it says, Dan, is that we are finally at a point in this community where the import of citizen thinking and opinion and evaluation is going to be weighed in what are actions mm -hmm. that have the potential to have a devastating effect on our community. Let's, let's talk about a couple of these recommendations. Okay. Uh, and let's try to deal with a couple that I think are, I, I don't know that they could be particularly controversial, but we'll see. Um, one of them, recommendation five, is that the police department, after an incident like this, convey its condolences to the grieving family, not necessarily going any farther and explaining anything. Um, why is that important? Excellent question, Dan. Um, that really personifies the point that I just made, and that is, 
This panel was designed not only for the purpose of reviewing the investigations and assessing thoroughness and accuracy, but we also have the task to have regular hearings in which we hear from the public. In our hearings, we routinely heard from the public that there was a, a lack of sensitivity, that there is a perception of a lack of caring. I tell you, if we're going to head in the direction of enhancing community relations and police relations, which is one of the edicts that we have under the ordinance, our recommendations are going to have to encompass not only findings of, of reasonableness or unreasonableness, but findings that go towards improving these relations. We believe that's one recommendation that's going to do that. Logistically, how that's implemented, we leave that to the police division, we leave that to the city. Okay. But citizens have clearly articulated that, that they view and have a perception of a lack of sensitivity. Uh, Tom, what about that? Uh, is that a problematic recommendation? Well, it's a very tense situation at times. You know, I, I think that you have to look at it from the perspective of law enforcement and that our goal at all times has to be there is never a use of force, there is never injury to a person, there is never injury to a citizen, to an officer, whatever. Those are very lofty goals, highly improbable to reach because of the dynamics of society. So when it and doesn't when, happen that way. When it doesn't happen that way and things deteriorate very quickly and someone winds up injured, perhaps seriously injured or even dies uh, as a result of, of, of some police intervention, um, typically the response from the family member is one of why did it happen, which it should be. Certainly I would want to know if something happened with my family member, but also probably some anger in that I've got a family member that's not with so, me So anymore. how is the family informed now? Uh, the family is informed now through the, the, the division's normal um, notification process where we send representatives of the division there. We have a police clergy team. Uh, so you're saying that, that you already convey condolences? Well, we, yes, we do. We do con convey condolences, but, I, but you have to think to yourself, and it's a very tense situation. It's a very difficult situation because people generally don't, hear what we're saying because it becomes so emotional so rapidly. If you can imagine how difficult it is to walk into someone's house and say oh. a family member has died and if you say a family member has died as a result of a police intervention, I there's pretty that. much an emotional and physiological shutdown what, that occurs. What change do you want concretely? Right. Condolence, uh, uh, the chief is saying that there already is someone sent out. What, right. what change do you want? Our assessment, Dan, is, is that whatever is happening, whatever process is proceeding, the perception in the community, the experiences by community citizens, views it as unacceptable. It's not working. So whether it's the use of a chaplain, whether it's immediately after, whether it's immediately after and then after uh, another yeah. visit, the logistics are clearly available. The point is, is that clearly citizens have spoken and, and communicated that it's not working today. There, yeah. and, and if we want to improve relations, the division and the city of Cincinnati have got to begin to devise and think about new alternatives, think in a new paradigm, because the perceptions aren't as what is, is being articulated. Okay, let's move on. I don't want to get stuck on any one of these. Recommendation two is that the division develop a specific policy disabling an automobile in the course of a non-routine traffic stop. We're not talking about running a stoplight or mm -hmm. a stop sign or something. something not non-routine, which is what this case was in the mm -hmm. Carpenter case. There were suspicions of other issues. Um, and specifically, you say, request that the transmission be placed in park when there's, it, you conclude it was left in drive, the engine turned off, and the police officer take the keys. Right. Is, that, is that what disabling means for you? Absolutely. And I think, obviously, in, in this case, and as citizens review this report, the entire 35 pages, I think it becomes clear that those actions or those inactions precipitated and escalated a situation uh, that ended up in the use of deadly force. What about that proposal? It seems, well, again, it seems reasonable. Very lofty thought also, because you have to think in lines of this. Is there, is there a design by the police division a recommendation for us to have an officer say, turn off your car, place the gear, the transmission in park, give me the keys? Okay, we say those things. What if the person does not cooperate with the officer? And that's the key to all these incidents. And in fact, when you think about this incident here, which is where I think the panel may have missed out on some very critical information, we had an officer with a gun pointed at that man. He wouldn't comply 
with, with the officer's orders, what makes you think that he is going to turn off the car, put it in park, and give you the keys? Keith? That's the difficult sure. situation, non-compliance. That's where this entire incident started to deteriorate. Again, if we, if we reflect on this issue from a standpoint of what cannot work, we're going to continue down the path of uh, continued tensions in this community. Based upon the facts, based upon the clear evidence and all of the information, by the way, we footnote every source of information. We've only reviewed information provided to us by the police division okay. and by OMI. So our sources are the police. Based upon their information, it's clear in this circumstance that not directing this individual to turn off the car, not instructing and, and having that kind of discourse allowed for this, uh, this situation to get escalated. Whether or, the question whether or not it would have had a difference or made a difference, who knows? But we've got to begin thinking in terms of making all alternative uses of other steps before things get escalated to the use of deadly force. So that's a tactical change that's being called for. You're saying it's easier to think of than implement. It's, it's not a tactical change. It is, it is by design a way that we train officers. It is by design a way that we do training. In fact, you would look into the police division's internal investigation report and see that we cited the actions of the officers not being appropriate in the way that they approached the vehicle, the way that one of the officers approached the vehicle, and that he did not offer that direction. What I'm saying to you is, is that because an officer, an officer directs a driver of a vehicle or a suspect to do a certain thing, absolutely he has no guarantee that that person will cooperate or will comply with the directions and in fact this case it's extremely clear that that person had no intention of complying because he wouldn't even comply when he was held at gunpoint by an officer. Okay, um, I know our original plan was just to spend the first half. Can you stay for a couple more minutes? Sure. Okay, I'm gonna change plans here so yeah. everybody upstairs should know that. Stay tuned. We'll come back in just a few minutes and complete our discussion with the chief and with Mr. Borders. Welcome back. You saw a bit of a little bit of a tape before we went into that commercial uh, that was referencing what I thought we were going to do the second half of the show, but we're going to continue uh, with Keith Borders uh, and Chief Stryker about the report of the Citizens Review Panel. So let's take up another one of these uh, proposals. We've talked about a couple of the recommendations already. Recommendation number three, Keith, says that Cincinnati Police Division should develop a policy regarding discharging a firearm into glass, a practice that Chief Stryker has labeled very dangerous. Uh, so you get quoted here. Uh, and what you're referring to is in the Carpenter incident, the shots were fired through the back window uh, of the glass, uh, of the automobile. Correct. Why is this, why does a new policy need to be developed here? Dan, the key question for this panel was determining whether or not a Cincinnati, a reasonable Cincinnati police officer would have shot more than seven times following standing 34 feet back from an automobile, in the back of the automobile, not understanding the tussle that is going on between his partner and the suspect, and to shoot through glass. We believe, obviously, that the, that the use of deadly force in this situation was unreasonable, but we also indicated that uh, it escalated to the point where Officer McCurley's actions were reckless. Uh, we believe shooting through glass and we questioned why, why is shooting through glass any different than shooting? Because Officer McCurley at that point begins to escalate uh, in, in this, this incident to the point where not only does he not understand what is happening in front of him, he stands 34 feet back and begins to shoot not necessarily clearly seeing the suspect. Because or, the glass shatters? Or the fact that his partner is in the car as well. So we, we believe that a series of, of situations escalated this, and perhaps this is one that can be cured by establishing a policy. Tom? Well, we certainly believe that Officer McCurley articulated three very clear concerns that he had, that the suspect posed a direct threat of death or serious physical harm 
to either himself or his partner. And that's one of the standards for determining reasonableness. That is that, that he saw his partner pulled alongside the car, that his partner was standing in an open door of that car, that the, the suspect was still in control of that car, so the car was able to be backed up, and if so, that the author, other officer would have been injured very seriously or perhaps even killed. And he said he did hear the car rev up. He said he did see the backup lights illuminate. And clearly, uh, the suspect was being held at gunpoint by the other officer and was not complying and was still moving around the car. And the officer so, believed that he may have been reaching for a weapon. But what about this point about shooting through glass? Very dangerous situation. Extremely dangerous. One of the keys here, the key here for us in teaching our officers is not whether or not you should th shoot through glass because there are a lot of situations I could sit here right now and give you a situation where I'm sure both of you would say, take the shot. If someone's threatening you and the only way I can shoot it is that the person threatening you is through the glass. The key here is when do officers make the proper decision to initiate action and use force, use some type of police intervention to save themselves. And you can't replace that that decisiveness that's necessary in a split second with a theoretical or sanitized world of imagination that occurs inside of a comfortable office 12 months after the incident occurs. Let me respond to that. Certainly. Dan, um, that's exactly what the expectation is of the community and I think was the expectation of the city council. Under the uh, police division's own procedures and policies, as they define when the use of deadly force can be utilized, it's clear that we have to, that police officers have to make that decision based upon a reasonable assessment of the facts. Clearly here, uh, Officer McCurley's actions were unreasonable and in fact reckless, particularly the fact that he was shooting through glass, particularly because of the fact he was shooting while his partner was in and out of the car, particularly because of the fact he was standing 34 feet behind the car. So you're correct. We can't be um, um, uh, quarterback quarterbacks after the fact, but we've been asked to assess the facts as analyzed by the police division. That's the, I, I that's just the think, conclusion I, we come to. I think through. I need to point out that what's reasonable sitting in an office 12 months after, after an incident occurs and analyzing facts at leisure is not the same idea of what's reasonable for that officer who's standing in a street facing an assailant at a critical time where I make a decision whether or not I or someone else loses their life. I'm, but, but, it's, but, it's, but it's what we have to do if we're going to give the police the authority to use deadly force. It's, it's the only analysis that we have. We can't put ourselves back in that situation. We have to assess witness statements. We analyzed McCurley's statements, which changed every time that he was interviewed. We have to assess reports and investigation reports. We have to visit the scene. We have to look at all of the evidence. What you're saying after is, the fact. if I understand, what you're saying is you have to investigate that in order to analyze policy for the future. It's not just about analyzing the past. Is that what you're saying? What I'm indicating is that, of course, we, we can't put ourselves in the situation. We have to assess the reasonableness of those actions, given the circumstances. Uh, Chief, I have less than a minute. Okay. Uh, where do we go from here? I think with we this from, process. With this process, I think we go from here with the police division working in concert with Keith and the rest of the panel members, with the entire community, with OMI, with our officers, with everybody's point of view, everybody's perspective, and take those things and put them together and consider what needs to be done in, 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 in the future so that we can improve training, so that we can improve efficiency, that we can improve the operations of the division, and so that also we can that we can improve the confidence level of our community and their police division. So we end this morning sort of where we started. This is a new process. Absolutely. Everybody's got to work this through. Uh, good luck. Thank you for being here this morning and talking frankly about this. My pleasure. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Next week, I'll be joined by Timothy Rubb, the new director of the Cincinnati Art Museum, who will be here to discuss the future direction of that cornerstone of the Cincinnati cultural community. We leave you this morning with some of the voices of election night setting the tone for the fall and reminding all of us what is important about elections. Have a good week. I just want to debate the, the whole range of issues that we face as county commissioners, whether it's our successes with welfare reform, countywide planning, and straightforward and honestly, riverfront development. I think that I've put forward the vision that this community has embraced a couple of different times, and I'm looking forward to, to defending that as well. The bottom line is that the voters are not going to be fooled anymore. They've been fooled too many times, and they've had enough, and they're not going to be fooled this time around. 
the voters are a lot smarter than the spin doctors think that they are. I'd certainly like to see the party stay out of selecting candidates. They need to be a referee and let the party people vote for them in the primaries, have free and open primaries, and that would certainly help the people get more involved. I think probably what leadership of the party will take a look at in the future is actually making endorsements in these type of races. We need to realize that we're in a democracy, and in the end, it's the voters who are the deciders in elections.